Harris for the opportunity to, to present data here and also uh, for the uh, putting together the ABA uh, signaling session. Um, briefly, I want to start off by acknowledging the members of my lab and collaborators who uh, worked on this project. Primarily, Taehoon Kim is a, or was a postdoc in my lab who spearheaded this project. He now is, has his own lab in Seoul, Korea, and other lab members that I will show on the slides, contribute to parts of this work. Also, Den Dennis Brodsky and Ben Brandt on reconstitution of ABA signaling and oocytes. And uh, we collaborated with Jane Parker at the Max Planck in Cologne and Walter Gassman at the University of Columbia, Missouri. And also thanks to Chris Somerville. This is a chemical genetics project. And he provided us originally with a 9,500 compound, including library. So. Uh, we are interested in, uh, in ABA signaling and also regulation of gas exchange and using guard cells as a system to understand early ABA signaling mechanisms. And today I will talk about how intracellular effector triggered pathogen signaling, ETI signaling, rapidly downregulates ABA signaling. That's the subject of the talk. And to sort of look at the bigger picture here, it's been shown by a number, several laboratories, that if you first stress a plant abiotically and turn on ABA signaling, that that down-regulates pathogen-resistant signaling. Uh, what I'm showing you today is that the opposite is also the case. If you first turn on an effector-triggered, or say intracellular effector pathogen-induced signaling, that that rapidly down-regulates ABA signaling. The mechanisms in these different crosstalks pathways are not identical, they're different. And of course, there's a question, where does this branch off from ABA signaling? Where does it compare ABA signaling? And where and how does that work? So uh, when Taehoon Kim joined my lab in uh, 2004, we set out to do a chemical genetics project looking for small molecules that downregulate or impair ABA signaling. And among others, Taehoon found a small molecule that turns on effector-triggered immune signaling and rapidly turns on ABA signaling. So this is sort of an overview of what my talk is about. And uh, this is Taehoon here with other members in the lab before he went to his own lab, very bright and creative person. And so first we had to create an ABA reporter line here, RAV18 promoter from our microarrays, GFP, very strong induction. This is leaf chlorophyll, red, and after ABA, GFP fluorescence. So we could screen in 96 well plates for chemicals that turn off this nice ABA-induced fluorescence. And after screening 9,500 compounds, we found four compounds that had this kind of effect. ABA induces gene expression, and one of them here, for example, inhibits this. The compound I'm talking about today uh, is a three-ring structure with a phenyl, furan, and piperidin ring, and we call it DFPN. And here's another ABA-induced reporter, RD29B, and again, DFPM exposure inhibits that ABA induction. So what about on a more genome scale? Over 40% of the ABA-induced genes are impaired in their expression level by ABA, whereas most of these genes are not affected much by DFPM itself. However, you can look at another cluster of genes, and this was initially surprising, DFPM alone itself induces a lot of genes. That got us a little worried. We started looking at them informatically, Felix Hauser and Taehoon Kim, and um, what we found is that many pathogen-induced genes are induced by DFPM. So this led to a larger search for understanding how DFPM inhibits ABA signaling, and I'm gonna make a very long story short because we published the first paper last year and I wanna get on to unpublished results uh, but after looking at many pathogen signaling mechanisms and pathways, the result of this from this study is sort of summarized here. Some early effector-triggered immune signaling mechanisms, the earliest known after resistance proteins, EDS1 and PAD4, two proteins of less well-understood biochemical function, and SGT1B and RAR1, two co-chaperones, that affect the stability of resistance proteins, so-called immune receptors. If you knock out or use loss of function alleles of any of these mutants, the ability of DFPM to inhibit ABA signaling is impaired. On the other hand, if you go downstream of 
these mechanisms in salicylic acid signaling or jasmonic acid signaling, or also if you look at PAMP signaling through EDS1, they all, mutants in this downstream mechanisms, all do not affect the ability of EFPM to rapidly downregulate ABA signaling. ABA induced stomatal closing is already is also downregulated by DFPM via these mechanisms, and there we've done experiments where we can, for example, we have to uh, expose guard cells or we expose guard cells for 15 minutes to DFPM, and already ABA signaling is downregulated. Maybe even more rapidly, we're looking at shorter time scales. So, um, uh, so what about early ABA signaling? Where is ABA signaling impaired by this? Uh, this shows the, uh, uh, the uh, beautiful work of Sean Cutler and collaborators, and Sean gave a beautiful talk at this meeting about the new paradigm for early ABA signaling that he and also independently Erwin Grill published. And uh, I won't go over the details since you've heard about it, but in brief, we looked at the biochemical mechanisms that are known here on PP2Cs, as well as SNRK kinase regulation. And ABA activation of these, of these biochemical mechanisms is not impaired by DFPM. We did further experiments where we found that DFPM affects calcium signaling, which acts roughly at this level. So I want to take a little detour for two slides and ask more about how calcium signal link fits into this paradigm and where DFPM may act. And uh, so what we're doing here is we're taking a target of rapid ABA signaling guard cells, the SLAC1 anion channel. If you express this in xenoplus oocytes, there's no uh, large activity. If you co-express the calcium-dependent protein kinase CPK6, you strongly activate the anion channels. If you then co-express a protein phosphatase like ABI1, you shut off the anion channels. And if you co-express an ABA receptor, that it does not affect the activation without ABA here. So what I'm showing you here is reconstitution of a calcium-dependent protein kinase activation. This has also been shown for OST1 and for another CDPK, CPK23, by Sheng Wan's lab and by uh, Geiger et al. What's new here is originally it was indicated by Geiger that CPK6 may not function in this response, and we had uh, previously shown that the CPK6 mutant in vivo functions as response, and indeed it does strongly affect this pathway. Now one thing that hasn't been shown yet is can ABA activate an ion, a plant ion channel in this reconstituted system, or are we lacking additional mechanisms? And in a paper that's just come out online, uh, we did show, sorry, uh, we did show that ABA activation can be reconstituted in this pathway. So you add ABA, and within a few minutes, you see the strong activation of the anion channels. Um, a few things just to briefly summarize some aspects of this study. We could reconstitute a functional ABA signaling pathway without a canonical SNRK kinase, but with a calcium-dependent protein kinase. And also, we found that in vitro, the PP2C ABI1 dephosphorylates and turns off SLAC1 and acts on a newly identified phosphorylation site. So question, can DFPM disrupt this ABA activation in oocytes? The answer is no from unpublished experiments. What about if we put a SNRK kinase here, OST1? Also the answer is no. Well, that means we need more mechanisms, so let's go to guard cells in vivo. And, um, and uh, so now in guard cells, in vivo, ABA activation of anion channels is impaired by DFPM exposure. Uh, so what's different here? What's required? Well, if we take a mutant, PAD4, in effector-triggered immune signaling, ABA can still activate the anion channels, but DFPM no longer is as effective at inhibiting the anion channels. So in the wild type, DFPM brings it down to control levels, whereas here, DFPM cannot turn off the anion efflux through the anion channels, consistent with what I told you earlier, work of Shintaro Munumasa. Um, so briefly, we have found also through other experiments that I haven't shown you that calcium-regulated stomatal closing is impaired by DFPM, suggesting that DFPM, through effector-triggered immune signaling, down-regulates ABA signaling at this level. Now, if we step back, the many mechanisms we looked at in immune signaling in this simplified but still complex model, 
shown in green boxes here are the mechanisms that are required for DFPM downregulation of ABA signaling, while those in red boxes, salicylic acid signaling, NDR1, and also a bunch of other mechanisms, jasmine acid signaling, uh, and uh, PAM signaling are not required for this response. So one implication from this work is there may be an, a an R protein, a resistance protein, a so-called nibbler nucleotide binding protein, LRR protein, that is required for DFPM signaling. However, as you may know, there are numerous, way too many nibblers to work with. But Tehun, through his elegant studies now in some unpublished work, has identified a tier nibbler that is required for the DFPM response. And he did this by identifying another phenotype of DFPM. In Colombia, if you expose roots or seedlings, uh, plants to DFPM, root growth, primary root growth is rapidly inhibited, but not in Landsberg. So there's natural variation here. In Colombia, root growth is inhibited, but not in Landsberg and not in these other accessions shown here. And through uh, uh, Tehun showed that this is due to a a major QTL on chromosome 5 and was able to identify the gene and lo and behold it's a previously uncharacterized toll uh, interleukin receptor nibbler type protein. Um, in comparing the structure of this to other accessions that are insensitive to DFPM, there are polymorphisms. If you express the Columbia gene in those insensitive accessions, you restore DFPM signaling. If you knock out uh, this Victor gene, as we call it, and you can then complement with the Columbia gene. I'm not showing you all the data. We call this Victor for variation in compound-triggered uh, root growth arrest. Um, so, uh, also, if we look at ABA-induced stomatal closing in wild-type, DFPM inhibits or partially inhibits this response, whereas uh, in the Victor mutant, this does not occur, consistent with what uh, with other uh, pathogen signaling. Now this root growth readout is really a powerful assay, and that's shown here. We can ask which genes are required for DFPM inhibition of root growth arrest. Well, we already know Victor is required. But again, these early ETI, effector-triggered immune signaling mechanisms, are required, but not downstream salicylic acid signaling, jasmonic acid signaling, and the other mechanisms that I mentioned. I might emphasize there's another crosstalk pathway with PAMP signaling that Xing Yang He and colleagues have characterized. This is a different uh, crosstalk mechanism based on a lot of genetics. Now, uh, what you can see here, again, PAD4, in PAD4, in a PAD4 mutant, DFPM does not inhibit root growth, while in a mutant affecting salicylic acid signaling it does, and so on and so forth. This is a very strong readout to look at various mutants or for screening. Um, I did want to mention, I mentioned earlier, not as much is known about the biochemical functions of EDS1 and PAD4. However, very recent work, six months ago, published by Jane Parker's lab and independently by Walter Gassman's lab, have shown that another R protein, RPS4, can interact with EDS1 and that this, uh, uh, or that they, they reside in the same complex, I should say, and that that had, plays a role in signaling. So Walter Gassman, many years ago, was a grad student in my lab, and we started a collaboration on this to ask if Victor might affect, uh, act within a complex with EDS1 or perhaps even PAD4. So here's some experiments from, oops, uh, from site. So this is the work that was published in Jane Parker's lab and Walter Gassman's lab six months ago, back-to-back -back papers in science, showing that EDS1 can interact with an R protein in, in Reform. So uh, here in Sycott and Walter's lab and Henning, my lab and Walter set out to do these experiments. First in split YFP or BIFC experiments, you can see Victor interacting with EDS1 in the nucleus of Bentaviana cells. And interestingly, Victor also in this assay shows an interaction with PAD4. Previously, no R protein has been shown to interact with PAD4. So this is potentially an interesting result. A uh, control bait doesn't show this type of interaction. This is, of course, split YFP, so what about co-immunoprecipitation? And here we have HA tag Victor and uh, MIG tag EDS1, PAD4, and a control, and you get co-immunoprecipitation of EDS1 with Victor and PAD4 with Victor. 
but not the control, indicating that EDS1 and Victor, or Pad4 and Victor, can form or co-reside in protein complexes in vivo. And we're further pursuing this interesting sort of biochemical um, uh, approach to understand this further. But in my lab, what we're really interested in is how does this effector-triggered immune signaling that is induced by the small molecule DFPN rapidly downregulate AVA signaling. And I think we have a powerful system to do this because we have a small molecule that we can add at a defined time point, and then we can do time result studies in guard cells, for example, to do this. And uh, so really, the next step is to use the small molecule to do what we set out to do, chemical genetics, uh, forward genetics in this case. And uh, so what Tehum did is he mutagenized the original uh, RAB18 GFP reporter line, very strongly induced by ADA, as I showed you in the first slides. DFPM inhibits this in wild type. And we select mutants in 96 well plates that even in the presence of DFPM maintain ABA-induced fluorescence. Now, if you do such a screen, you will find new alleles in PAD4, EDS1, SGT1B, RAR1, and Victor. But uh, here we have two examples of two mutants that do not, based on rough mapping, co correspond to known ABA or known effector-triggered immune signaling genes. And we call these RDA for reduced DFPM inhibition of ABA signaling mutants. And we believe these are quite interesting. Let me show you some data on RDA2, um, uh, why we think this is the case. Here we're looking at ABA-induced stomata closing without any DFPM now. In wild type, ABA closes stomata. In RDA2, this is impaired. There's no DFPM here, but there's an impairment. And perhaps in RDA1 also. And I'm not showing the data here, but if you look at seed germination assays, RDA2 is hyposensitive, slightly ABA insensitive. RDA1, not so. So these mutants affect ABA signaling. And in a model here, I want to explain and maybe mention some additional unpublished data why we think RDA2 and also RDA1 are interesting. We're interested in how this crosstalk occurs. In RDA2, DFPM inhibition of ABA signaling is impaired, but alone, without DFPM in RDA2, we also get a partial reduction in ABA signaling, indicating that RDA2 affects or acts at this crosstalk point. Uh, furthermore, in RDA2, DFPM-induced pathogen resist response, uh, PR gene expression is intact, consistent with this model. Our data on RDA1 suggests that it acts a little further up here, but also in this pathway. So uh, we're interested to further characterize that. So let me just summarize my talk here. I told you about how we have found a small molecule that rapidly downregulates ABA signaling. It acts through an intracellular immune signaling pathway, effector-triggered immune signaling pathway, and we've identified that early immune signaling mechanisms and a specific R protein are required for this, but not downstream and other mechanisms. In addition, I showed you that Victor was identified, the R protein, by seeing a rapid root growth arrest response. I haven't shown you much of those data, but this is a root meristem, primary root meristem induced cell death response that we view as a typical PCD program cell death response. And this is a very powerful assay. In immune signaling, ETI signaling, not much is known from pad four to cell death. And I think that this will be an assay and a system that will be of interest to the immune signaling community. We're, of course, interested in this crosstalk mechanism. And to step back from this for a second, of course, in general, it's an interesting question. Why and how do plants have this crosstalk? Why is it that a, a plant is first experiencing activation of this e ETI pathway? Do you downregulate ABA signal? Of course, the opposite question, and that's known from work in other labs, why is it if you get initial ABA signaling, do you lose out on pathogen signaling? These are, I think, very relevant and interesting questions for plant biology. And uh, so I uh, had acknowledged uh, members in my lab and our collaborators uh, at the introduction of my talk, so I think I'll finish there by just showing this slide again. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.